take pictures in here without yeah, a flash. Just not in the Sistine Chapel. He said inside. Hey. You want a cell phone? Use flash. If you have the flash on. Not now. I quite a few discoveries with our cross up above, whose name was Michelangelo Simonetti. Now please follow me, follow me, we turn right. If I walk eventually a little faster, it's because I want to try to gain a position which will give us the opportunity to talk about the Sistine Chapel. So then I will, will, will not start until you actually get there. We'll talk also afterwards, we'll talk about the courtyard here. So now let's stay together like a family. Okay, follow. Don't worry, I won't start until you. I'm staying with him so I get his voice. Can't describe it perfectly from from the. Uh, I mean, we cannot talk inside the chapel. That's a problem. Otherwise, it would be nice. Okay, now let's see. Okay, here we are one two. Okay, make you. Now I will keep the mic close, close to my, my mouth in order that we don't disturb the colleagues who are explaining. Now we have to share in these uh, panels. Okay, let's wait till everybody comes. Okay. Okay. Come closer, come closer. You need to look at the panels in a minute, not right away, but in a minute you do need to look, otherwise you don't understand anything about Allora. Allora. Then we talk about the courtyard. I tell you everything about the courtyard. Okay, now, first of all, <coughs> Sistine Chapel. Why we call it Sistine Chapel? We call it Sistine Chapel from Sixtus, or as we say, Sisto, Sistus, okay? Sixus the fourth, who was the, who was the Pope who actually built up the walls. And this, the walls of the Sistine Chapel, so the chapel was built in a short time, in about three years, between 1477 and 1480. Okay. Now, in 1481, the Pope decides, of course, to decorate the chapel. Okay. And so, of course, you know, being the Pope, he calls la creme de la creme of the artists, you know, all the best artists of the time. So names like uh, number one, Perugino, okay, Pietro Vannucci, known as Perugino, Domenico Ghirlandai, uh, Botticelli, Bartolomeo della Gatta, Luca Signorelli, I mean, you know, all these best, you know, best existing artists. And uh, the chapel is dedicated to the Assumption of Mary, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, Pietro Perugino, so uh, he actually paints an Assumption of Mary on the main altar. Anyway, that you are not going to see it because, you know, with the time, you know, we have the works of Michelangelo which come afterwards. So the first decoration of the chapel, of the Sistine Chapel, let's say that partially nowadays is not visible because of the works which were done afterwards by Michelangelo, okay? What uh, is, uh, but there is quite, quite a bit of the very first decoration of the chapel that is still over there. That's to say, now look, you see, this is the chapel, uh, if you were looking at the main altar, it will appear to you like this, okay? And here on the main altar, we will have the last judgment, okay? But uh, 
at the, when they first built the chapel over here by the main altar, we had the Assumption of Mary. Okay. Then the side walls basically they have remained the same because we have, as you look at the main altar on the left side, we have the stories of the Old Testament, and on the right side here, you know, we have the stories of the New Testament. Oh, remember one thing: every story starts always from the altar because the altar symbolizes God so everything you know starts from God okay so in those stories they are still visible plus uh, up above between the windows there is a series of portraits of popes which were done also with with the first decoration which was done in a short time actually because between 1481 and 1482 practically the the chapel was all decorated but of course uh, remember that uh, during these uh, uh, works you know there was uh, practically a number of quite a few painters there but not only also this, uh, the helpers you know and so forth so this is why you know it took you know a, a short time you know for the first decoration the ceiling of the chapel was decorated with a beautiful sky with stars okay and so again the sky will start now we don't have it anymore because we have the works of Michelangelo the famous ceiling of Michelangelo which will come afterwards but we have still again practically the decoration of the side walls you see the lower part with the stories of the old and new testament and the portraits of the popes up above reaching the windows okay you can read here these, these are six stories on one side on the left side as you look at the main altar, all the testament and six stories, you know, of the New Testament, okay, on the right wall. First one here, you see. Is, oh, let me tell you that sometimes uh, some of the uh, these uh, these uh, pictures, these paintings, or these frescoes, actually, you see, they can describe even more more stories in one in just one painting. For instance, here. The first one, you see, we have this one is Moses, this is Moses again, this is Moses again. Three moments of the life of Moses. Here is when in the back, when he says goodbye to his uh, father in law and he leaves, goes into Egypt. This is when he meets the angel because he wants to, the angel wants to punish him because he has not circumcised his son. And, and then nearby, the circumcision. Circumcision takes place. Okay. Attention, as a parallelism between the first picture here, because the most important story out of the three here uh, is this one here, the circumcision. Because for the, the circumcision is practically the beginning of the religious life for the Jewish people. It's also when they get the name, you know, they get the name, so they become a person actually. So. This is when the circumcision takes place. As a parallelism, you see the first picture of the stories of the New Testament, which starts with the, the baptism of Jesus. You see. This is one in front of the other, because the baptism for the Christians, you know, is the beginning of the, of the, let's say, of the religious life. Okay? So this is why they are set up one in front of the other. Okay. This is the first of the left side, as you look at the main altar, this is the first of the right side, the New Testament. And then let's look up at the stories of the Old Testament here. The, let's say when, when uh, uh, actually uh, Moses uh, helps you know, the daughters of Jethro to drink the water, because, to let the flock drink the water, because other shepherds, they don't, they don't want them to do that. Here is when he kills an Egyptian, then he runs away because, you know, he had been bad, you know, with some, with, uh, with some of his people. Here, this is the famous crossing, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, you see here. Okay. Then here, this is the table of the law, the, the, the handing of the table, or the tables of the law. As you know, Moses went two times to get the tables of the law because the first time when he came down, you see, and he saw his people worshipping a golden calf there. You see, that, that's the golden calf in the back there. You see it better, bigger in, in the science, this is in Chalo anyway. 
Then he got mad and he broke, you know, the tables of the law. And then anyway, he went back and he brought them down. This is when, you know, he brings them down. And here, this is a very important uh, uh, picture, this one here. See, this is uh, the punishment of Kor, Datan and Abiron, who were these guys, I mean, they rebelled to the authority of Moses on the way to the Holy Land, you know, together with a, a couple of hundred people there. And so they've been punished, okay? Now, but the other, the artist, see, Botticelli, imagines that this happens in front of the Arch of Constantine. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be going by the Colosseum, and the Arch of Constantine is right next to the Colosseum. Why? It didn't happen there, of course, you know. We were in another country. But uh, this is symbolical, because the uh, Arch of Constantine means Rome, and so it means uh, the Pope, it means the authority of the Pope. In other words, it wants to be a message, you know. If you rebel, you know, to don't rebel to the authority of the Pope, because otherwise you're going to be punished, as Coer, uh, Daten, uh, and Apiron, they've been punished, you know, on the way to the Holy Land. This is the message. Then here we have the last part of the life of Moses. Moses was promised to see the Holy Land, but not to reach it, you know. So this is why you can see up in the back here, the angels who shows you know Moses you know from the distance the holy land and then you see they come down and he dies here this is you know what this part represents and here is the testament of Moses and this is a, an important moment the moment in which Moses passes the symbol of the power okay to Joshua okay so this is what it represents then here we have the baptism of Jesus okay and we have seen this already. And then uh, here below we have the temptations of Christ. The temptations, you see, they are represented here in the back. You see, it's like, you know, Jesus is with the devil. The devil is tempting, you know, Jesus, you know, talking about, you know, you can have this, you can have that, you know, and so forth. And this is what this represents. While up front is represented the ceremony of the purification of the leper. While here we have the calling of the first apostles. You see, the two kneeling persons here, they are the two brothers, St. Peter and St. Paul. Here. Then here we have the Sermon of the Mount. Yeah. It's represented uh, like a very low mountain, you know. It's, uh, it's more a podium than a mountain, really, you know. But that's, and the pitcher's it's, mound. It's, it's, it's symbolical, anyway. And here, this is also a very interesting one, and it's also beautiful from the artistic point of view. Uh, look at the, this is the really the a clear sample of the of the Renaissance, you know, perspective. Okay, which is a rational, uh, uh, let's say, uh, per, uh, perspective is not you know a real one. You know, it's a convention in a way. And you see in the back here, you know, everything you know is focalizing towards here, where is this church, imaginary church, and here up front which is the handing over of the keys, symbolically, I mean, it didn't happen, Jesus did not give to Peter real keys. Ah, Perugino he makes it, you know, that way to make the message more clear, let's say, but, you know, this is the famous uh, moment in which uh, Jesus appoints Peter practically as his successor and it is very, very important because at, at their turns, the popes being the successors of Peter, you know, they are going to be, you know, representing, you know, in a different way, God on earth. And this is why this is very important. This is a famous expression, you are Peter and on you I will found right. my church and I will give you the keys of the paradise. Inside the church of St. Peter's, it's written along the central name, mm. at the base of the dome, in Greek and Latin. This is, you know, the writing, I don't know if you know this, but we're going to be back there, you see it again. And this is where you, you know, because it's important, because it appoints, you know, the popes, you know, the successor of uh, Jesus. And then, you know, look, this one is the Last Supper. What is, uh, you see, you've seen the famous, the world famous Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. But there is something interesting about this Last Supper here, eh? and is uh, what uh, what these three windows in the back represent. You see, 
they look, you know, at the first look, they may look just like, you know, open windows to a landscape, to some sort of landscape. But they are two, three windows opened up on a future event which is just about to happen. That's uh, to say, yeah. if you look through the windows, you're going to see first, you know, through this window on the left, you're going to see Jesus who's praying in the garden after the supper, okay? Then they cap the second in the middle, the capture of Jesus. And the third is the crucifixion. So it shows you, there are like three windows opened up on the next future, which is going to happen right after the summer. Do you have any questions? Was I clear? Yeah, very okay. good. Very good. Bene. Allora, now, let's uh, change uh, subject. Now we go, so, mm, we go here. Allora, now, the chapel, so the chapel, again, stays, you know, like this for quite a bit. So then, uh, we are in 1508, the nephew of Sixtus IV, you know, is uh, the successor, you know, I mean, uh, he's Pope at that point, he was not the successor of his uncle, could there, there have been other, other, other Popes in between, but I mean, uh, the nephew of Sixtus IV decides that he wants to change the decoration of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel because uh, there was getting a little damage, you know, he said, you know, I want to change it. So he wants Michelangelo to do this work. Michelangelo was very reluctant to do the, to it. He didn't want to do it. Also because, and actually he was sincere. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Anyway? Yeah. Okay, uh, he was sincere. He didn't want to do it because he didn't have the, the, the knowledge of the technique of fresco. You know, and uh, uh, because it is, uh, you know, the technique of, uh, of frescoing is uh, a very difficult technique. You know, it's called, it's nicknamed the technique without repenting. In other words, you cannot change your mind. As the word says, fresco, fresh. You work on the fresh plaster. The fresh plaster after seven, eight hours dries up. So if you don't complete your work within that time, you know, forget it. So you have to take off the plaster, re rebuild the, the plaster, you know, and so that's, this is why it's complicated. So Michelangelo didn't want to do it. And so he refused and this and that, but then, you know, you cannot say no to the Pope for too long. <laughs> so he was obliged to do it, you know. And uh, he, the only thing he asked if he could uh, eventually do uh, have the freedom of uh, choosing the subject. Uh, but, you know, Michelangelo was a very educated person, besides being you know, an excellent artist, and so uh, the Pope said yes, okay, because the Pope had in mind to do, like, you know, the Twelve Apostles, you know, something like that. Uh, Michelangelo had the idea of uh, actually, uh, you know, connecting, in a way, the stories of the walls below, because uh, we had Old Testament, New Testament, he decided to describe the, the genesis, so from the origins of the world, you know, to the flood. And this is, you know, what he did. Look, uh, he helped himself, you know, with, the, with this sort of fake, you know, architecture in a way, in order to balance, you know, his uh, efforts, you know, for the frescoing, you know. And he described in nine pictures, nine panels, you see, one, two, three, four, and so forth, you know, from the origin of the world, you know, to the uh, creation of man, the creation of the woman, to uh, the paradise, you know, the hidden, you know, life in Eden, and then the, the uh, let's say, the, the original sin, you know, and then the flood, okay? And uh, uh, here, so in the middle, we have these stories here, okay? In, uh, around, you know, the these uh, central, you know, uh, descriptions here. Oh, remember, always, always stories start from the main altar. That means that, you know, we have, this is the ceiling, okay? That means that uh, being here, you know, the creation of light, the first panel is the creation of light, the main altar is down here because, you know, the altar, this is Jonas, by the way, eh? look at this. Oh, so nine pictures here, okay? And the first one is the creation of light, okay? Then the second one is the creation of stars and planet and the flora and fauna, which is represented you know, by these bushes here down below. Then the separation of waters from earth, 
the third panel. Then this one, they celebrated, you know, creation of animals with the famous, you know, two fingers, you know, that uh, even if they don't touch, but you know, the creative energy of God, you know, goes inside the body of Adam. Uh, and uh, uh, in a way, I tell you a curiosity, but uh, it is more, it is nothing official, absolutely. I mean, we don't have any written records about this, so it may be uh, just a coincidence, as it may be eventually done on purpose. But if you look at this you know, uh, fresco here, you see, if you look at this, this can look, you know, this is God, this can look a little bit like the section of a brain. See? Like the section of a brain. Doesn't it? Yes. If you cut in you know, a brain in two, which Michelangelo, knowing anatomy so well, he may have decided to do on purpose. Because what did he want to tell us eventually if this is, if he did it on purpose? Okay? Well, you see, there is, uh, this is, this means practically that this is my, God's mind. In a way, and you see, God here is uh, hugging with the left arm. He's hugging a woman. That means that means that while he's, cre he's creating Adam, he has already in mind to create you know, the woman. And so this could be. It makes could make sense. But again, there is no truly really no proof. You know. Could be, could not be. Okay. And then you know here we have the typical creation of. Uh, the woman according you know to the Bible from the rib you know of uh, Adam here you see and then you know, when they are you know in paradise and in Eden they are happy they are beautiful you know so then you know they eat the forbidden fruits and you see they are chased away you know from uh, Eden and then here we have well three the last three stories these and these should be reversed actually because this one here is the sacrifice of Noah, which, which happens at the very end of everything, after they've been, they've been saved, you know, actually. But, you know, for, um, let's say, for uh, his own convenience, he, evidently, he decided to do it uh, the other way around. Okay, so he did the, practically, the drunkenness of Noah as the last one, but he did it first. This is the first one he did, okay? That's uh, the drunkenness of Noah. Here. And this one is the flood. You see the flood, we have the Ark of Noah, looks like a house, you see in the back there. Then we have three groups of people here. This is a boat, you know, which is overloaded and it's about to sink, you know. Here there is an island where some, we call them the selfish ones, they, there's some people who would like to join them on the island, but they kind of chase them away, they don't want them with them. And this, on the contrary, is a group of generous people because they help each other as much as they can. There is even an old man who carries a young one, you know, over his shoulders in order to save him, you know. So this is a group of the generous ones. Oh, attention. Just, we don't know exactly the why, you know. But anyway, a, let's put it like it's a sort of decoration. <clears throat> or also, it has been guessed also like uh, uh, Michelangelo wanted to show how beautiful uh, you know, mankind could have been without the original scene eventually. But anyway, as a decoration, one panel yes, one panel no, one yes, one no, one yes, one no, you have the famous nudes of Michelangelo around, you see? Okay, you have the four nudes, you know, which are a decoration to the, to the story, to the main story that is described. Then, around, you know, at the four corners, four corners, we have four big sails, they describe four moments of the life of Israel in which uh, God has helped. Okay, let's just say, for instance, the brazen serpent, the punishment of a man, uh, Judith and all of them, David and Goliath. Okay, so these are the stories. Then, around the central stories of the, you know, of the Genesis, you have sitting, you know, kind of sitting. You have 12 figures, you see, 12 figures around. Seven prophets and five Sibyls. Why also the Sibyls? Sibyl is a pagan, let's say, person, you know, I mean, uh, but, you know, they are represented there because uh, even if they were pagan, but as they could foresee the future, they have announced the coming of God. So this is why they, are, they find a place, okay, 
around, you know, the genesis. Okay. Then you have small sails, you see, here. And then you have below, we don't see them, but there are like small lunettes here, which are also decorated. All of these, you know, they represent portraits of all of the ancestors of Christ. Of course, imaginary portraits, but you have actually all of the ancestors of Christ. Okay? Any questions on these? No? Okay, we're almost finished. I know that you're getting back. This is important because in this, inside the chapel I cannot say a word. I'm sorry, but... Okay, let's go to it now. So, here. so the chapel... Oh, by the way, Michelangelo, you have to figure that it, he has been working there for four years, which in 1508 and 1512 to do all of the city, and basically has done everything by himself, because as soon as he understood how to work, you know, with the fresco technique, he fired everyone, and he stayed there alone, okay? Oh, here we have the... We have the the last judgment. Allora, the chapel stayed like that for quite a bit. In the 30s or the 1500, the Pope Clement VII, you know, asked Michelangelo to start working on a project of having a last judgment on the main altar, which was a very unusual request because usually, you see, you do last judgments in the inside facade. Why? Because the inside facade is the last part of the church you see on the way out. So that can be like a warning. Hey, watch out. Look, you know, what happens to you if you don't behave, you know? That was unusual. But uh, uh, let's say that the Pope had gone through a terrible experience, you know, with the sack of Rome when the, uh, the, the army of Charles V, they entered the city, I mean, they, in the inside of the Vatican, they devastated also some of the tombs, you know, the paraments, you know, the, 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 the clothing of the popes, the bones of the popes who were thrown all over the place, including uh, Pope uh, Julius II and uh, Sixtus IV, anyway. And uh, so, uh, after this experience, you know, and he wanted to, to have, you know, this last judgment on the main altar. Anyway, he waits uh, and he just does some uh, cartoons, you know, some of the preparation. But he doesn't really operate on the wall at all. Uh, the Pope dies, next Pope, uh, Paul III, he knows about this project, so he calls Michelangelo and so Michelangelo, go back to work, Michelangelo, you have to do it. And Michelangelo, at that point, he was in his 60s. So, of course, he was not a young man anymore. And it was a tremendous job, you know, what he was asked to do. Because, you see, we are talking of approximately 600, and more than 600 square feet, you know, of uh, uh, fresco, you know. And uh, uh, to do, you know, at that age, six years old already, was uh, something very, very... Uh, complicated. Anyway, he accepted and he, and he did, you know, this. He, he did the last judgment, you see. And uh, we have something like 391 figures. If you go count them, you know, one by one, 391 figures inside this uh, last judgment. And you see we have here, up above, we have the angels who carry the, the symbols of the Passion, that's to say the cross, the crown of thorn here, you know, then the column of the flagellation. Then in the middle, you see, we have uh, Jesus with the Virgin Mary. Yeah. You see, the Virgin Mary is very solid. She doesn't want to look because, you know, even if, if she knows that, of course, the sinners, they are to be punished, but she is kind of, you know, sorry anyway for the mankind, you see, she doesn't want to look. And then uh, here we have, in the middle, we have Jesus, who is represented more like an Hercules rather than, you know, the usual, let's say, figure of Jesus we are, uh, let's say, we have in our mind, you know, sweet, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but he's here, you know, to judge. He's here to judge. So this is why he's represented that way. And you see, with the right hand, he almost seems to bring, you know, to pull up, you know, the good ones who are, you know, these ones on this side, you see, below. There is a sort of resurrection of the bodies, then there is a resurrection of the bodies, you see, and they're going up, you know, towards heaven. With the left hand, he almost seems to push down the bad ones, you see, they are thrown down here, you see, 
Now in the middle we have the angels who play the trumpets, you know, to wake up everyone, the dead and the living ones. Okay. Then is you know Jesus and the Virgin Mary are surrounded by you know sands, you know, of old times and so forth. Some of these sands we can recognize because of uh, some attributes that they are carrying with them. For instance, you see here with a big key in his hand. Who else can be, if not St. Peter? St. Peter, he looks, he's almost turning in the key, giving back the key, because you see, this is the end of time. He doesn't need the key anymore, okay? So this is what St. Peter is doing. Here, on this side, we have St. Andrew. You can tell from the, the cross, you know, the cross of St. Andrew? See, he's dragging the, his cross here, okay? Yeah, this is St. John the Baptist, this one here. Down below we have here, this is the symbol of their martyrdom, you see, we have St. Lawrence who was grilled, you know, alive, so he, he has a grill on his hand here. And here, this is St. Bartholomew, Bartholomew was skinned alive, and uh, you see he holds his skin in his hand here with the left hand, but you look at this, this is not the face of St. Bartholomew because this is a, a self-portrait of a suffering Michelangelo. <laughs> See, the, that's him, it's Michelangelo suffering. And then here again, we have two figures. Oh, well, well, here we have some more saints. Eh? You have, you know, with the two that we are, St. Catherine from Alexandria, right? Then you have holding is the arrows, who else if not St. Sebastian, right? And then, you know, the sword, the sword is uh, St. Uh, Simon, Simon, and then St. Biagio holding the, the iron comb, you know, and so on. While here we have two figures, you see down below, which are taken from the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, and they are inspired by the, the Divine Comedy. One of them is Caronte, you see this guy with a horse who's beating up, you know, the, the, the bad ones, you know, you chase them out of the of the ship, you know, there. Like we us on the bus. Boat. And uh, and the other one is here at the corner. This guy here at the corner is represented as the judge of hell. He's uh, like the doorman of hell. He's, he judges and he tells you where to go, okay, what kind of punishment you're going to have. And this is Minos, this is another figure, Minos. But you see what happens, this has been magnified also because this person is a real person. You know, this is a, the portrait, the figure, is a, the figure of a real person. You know, this guy was Biagio from Cesena, we know, it's, it's true. Biagio from Cesena was the master of ceremony of the Pope Paul III, okay? And it seems that uh, he used to give such a hard time to Michelangelo. Michelangelo, at a certain point, he handed up to here. He was tired, and so he put it in hell. He put him in hell. <laughs> now, of course, you have to figure that these guys here. I mean, the master of ceremony was not allowed to get inside the Sistine Chapel, you know, during the works. I mean, even the Pope, even the Pope, sometimes, you know, I mean, he had a hard time convincing.